Good morning and welcome to the Court of Appeals. We have two cases on our 9 o'clock docket, one case on our 10 o'clock docket. We're going to take a short break uh, after the 9 o'clock docket uh, has concluded. Uh, our first case is People versus FIBO. I see counsel are set up and ready to proceed. Uh, does either of you have any questions? Uh, for purposes of our spectators, if any of you has a cell phone or similar device, would you please turn it off so the lawyers are not interrupted? Uh, on that basis, we're ready to proceed with argument in People versus FIBO. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Elizabeth Griffin appearing on behalf of Raul FIBO. The prosecution failed to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, but unless the court has questions about that issue, I'm planning to focus on issue two and perhaps issue three if there's time. I will take questions about anything. Um, the court abuses discretion when it continued the trial over defense objection. And the reason is that when the reason for a motion for continuance is a mis missing witness, the movement has the burden of establishing that he exercised due diligence. And that's true regardless of whether speedy trial is at issue. Because if you look at um, the cases of Mann and Miller from our Supreme Court, those were trial cases where the defense was moving for a continuance, um, so speedy trial was not at issue. What was at issue was the defendant's right to call important expert witnesses in those cases. Um, however, the court decided that uh, the defense had in man um, decided not to serve the witness, which was a trial tactic subject to the risk of backfiring. And so the court said you have no right to complain about um, the denial of your psychiatric expert in what was a, initially a sanity case and then became an impaired mental condition case um, because you didn't show due diligence you decided not to subpoena the witness. And in Miller, similar. Um, the defendant delayed. He found out his expert was injured in an accident. He didn't immediately tell the prosecution in the court. He didn't immediately move for a continuance. And the court said, well, that's too bad. You didn't exercise due diligence. So we're going to trial and you don't get your expert. Is, is it your position that where uh, speedy is not an issue, lack of diligence ends the inquiry, or is it still a multifaceted test? I think it should end the inquiry. Um, but even if it's a multifaceted test, Mr. Fibo should have prevailed. Um, well, let's look at that. Uh, first, did the trial court make a finding on lack of diligence? No, because I believe the court thought it didn't need to. Are you asking us to make that factual finding on appeal? And, and if so, can we do that? I think in this case you can, because I think in this case it's absolutely clear that no diligence was exercised. Not just that there wasn't as much caution as there should have been, um, but this DA knew from the very beginning that the mom didn't believe the girl and didn't want to come to the trial, and he knew since January, which was nine months before the trial, that they had moved to Texas and they were staying in Texas. Um, he should have started the Uniform Act procedures at that point, but even in uh, early August, month and a half before trial, when mom was actively avoiding his phone calls, he did not initiate the Uniform Act. He just did nothing. Counsel, given the potentially, um, I mean, devastating or dire consequences here for the prosecution, I mean, they could have just not been able to prove their case. Why isn't it, you know, why should we second guess the trial court's decision? Well, I guess I would point to, and admittedly, Mann and Miller were cases affirming denials, but the consequences in those cases were extremely dire for the defense. The court said, you didn't exercise diligence. You don't get your most important expert witness too bad. And that's a fundamental constitutional right. So, I mean, I think the moral of the story in the law is that both parties have to exercise due diligence, and they have to exercise at least some diligence. 
Um, here, there's just no excuse whatsoever for this felony prosecutor in Adams County to not do anything. Well, I mean, there was an excuse, and apparently the trial court accepted this excuse, which was he, he thought mom was cooperating. Oh, I don't think the trial court accepted his excuse. This gets to Judge Webb's point that the court made no finding about due diligence. Well, I guess in granting the continuance, I think we can say it at least implicitly didn't challenge it. The court mistakenly believed due diligence wasn't even a factor, apparently, until we get to speedy trial, which that is clearly not true, whether or not you believe it's conclusive. It's obviously a factor, and when it, a missing witness is your reason, it's at least the primary factor. Uh, here, the judge, the judge's comments indicate that he didn't think the DA exercised due diligence, but he said, well, we'll put that off and see if you're ready before a speedy trial, indicating that he thought it wasn't relevant. And that's absolutely wrong. Of course it was relevant. It was the most relevant factor. What, what, would you speak to the question of prejudice uh, to Mr. Thiebaud since the trial did occur within the speedy deadline? He, he, and he, he, as I recall, he's, he's bonded out, so he's not incarcerated. Uh, where's the prejudice? Well, as his counsel explained, he was unable to work because his work involved traveling and he couldn't travel with the bond. And he was under tremendous stress from the uncertainty. And this sort of accusation, allegation in particular, it's difficult for us to imagine. But, you know, the defendant is presumed innocent. So let's imagine what that would feel like if one were accused of sexually assaulting one stepchild and wanted to resolve it because one felt one would be exonerated, and this just keeps getting put off. Um, the amount of stress is difficult to imagine, and that was the prejudice to him. And would that make this case, and, and the, the delay was about two months, was it not? Um, I, I'm not certain. Two it was three. within speedy. Yeah, okay. Would, would the, the stress that you're referring to, which I'm sure is legitimate, substantially distinguish this case from anybody else who's facing a major felony and a potential lengthy sentence? Well, you know, <laughs> the lack of due diligence in this case is overwhelming. And even if you're weighing factors and saying that that's not dispositive, I think it should be, but even if it's not, that's the primary factor when the reason is a missing witness. So when you look at the amount of weight that should get, and then you add the prejudice, which I think is greater in a case like this, because the stigma of these allegations is tremendous. Um, this is somebody who had no criminal record, who had a job. Um, so yes, I would, I would argue it's clear that the court abused its discretion in granting this continuance. Um, I guess I will talk about the prosecutorial misconduct a little bit. Um, and there's a, a lot, so I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights. And please feel free to interrupt me. Um, but starting with the presentation of evidence, the DA, after the court twice sustained objections to his questions of the detective about whether, what are the protocols for SANE and whether a SANE exam would have revealed anything in this case because one week had passed. Uh, after two objections were sustained, the prosecutor asked basically the same question again. Um, and the detective agreed she wouldn't bother recommending a SANE examination. Based on her experience. That's right. Well, of which she had none, of which the defense showed. Well, she had not been endorsed or qualified as an expert. And the defense on cross showed that she had little or no experience, which kind of undermined her opinion if it had any weight at all. So I guess what I'm getting at is, okay, she, maybe she should have said it, but it doesn't seem very harmful in this context. Oh, well, I, you know, I would disagree because when the case is based solely on one person's word against another's, um, the lack of physical evidence should be very significant, especially when there was only one week between what the girl claimed was the last incident and her outcry. Yes. But this just completely neutralizes it. This just pushes that to the side and tells the jury it's not important. Um, 
she told the jury she had investigated well over 100 child sex assault cases. I mean, I'm glad you found the defense cross-examination effective. I don't think we can assume, well, if you did. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that they did raise on cross-examination that she had little or no experience, which would have arguably, and they probably argued, undermined her uh, view as to whether a sane examination was well, I know, Judge, I, I guess you're I not even convinced yeah. that it was so effective, but I don't think we can assume that the jury found it effective. I, I would have to revisit the actual examination. But when you've got a detective, this is what they do. They've done over 100 <clears throat> cases. When the DA asked about the protocols, she said, oh, yes, these are the protocols. Only children's will do it. This is how it works. She certainly sounded like she knew what she was talking about. Um, and she sounds like, to the jury, someone who knows how these cases work having done well over 100 of them. Um, the DA asked uh, mom, do you in fact remember Phoebo's father telling you it was his son and he was in denial? And this was extremely prejudicial hearsay. Um, and the objection was sustained. But this was so damaging because telling the jury that the defendant's father said, oh, my son's just in denial, that's really damning. That's difficult for the jury to disregard, and that never should have come in. Um, and then eliciting from the detective that JP had told him about the babysitter's story, and he knew what that conversation was, and there was no blindfold and no oral or anal sex, that was flagrant misconduct because that was completely inaccurate. And the DA agreed with it, but then the defense was able to elicit, but she didn't tell you the story. But the level of misconduct there is really, really troubling. Um, I'm going to save my time for rebuttal because I'm running out of time. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Russell Johnson, registration number 48482, representing the people in this matter. The people requested oral argument in this case primarily to address issue two, the continuance question, given the fundamental difference in the test that the parties are advocating before this court. And so I intend to focus first on that issue and then turn to the remaining issues. Regarding the continuance, neither party disagrees that this issue is reviewed for an abuse of discretion, whether the trial court acted in a manifestly unreasonable, arbitrary, or unfair manner. The difference, as I think Judge Webb, your comment pointed out, is in how the trial court's decision should be evaluated. Is this a totality of the circumstances test, or as Mr. Fee was advocating for, can a continuance ever be granted in the absence of due diligence? Is that a requirement to grant a continuance? And the case law does not support using that as a requirement for granting. In People v. Hampton and People v. Bakary, the Colorado Supreme Court specifically rejected the notion that there are mechanical tests to be applied in this context. And in Bakary, the court actually identified factors slightly different from the DJP factors that discuss the adequacy of alternatives, the public's interest in prompt resolution of matters, prejudice to the non-moving party in granting the continuance, the consequence of denying the continuance, in that case dismissal, a particularly harsh consequence, as you recognize, Judge Fox. And in that case, also mentioned was the speedy trial right. As if to reaffirm that this is a totality test, people in the interest of DJP also used a factor approach to evaluate the decision to continue. And in DJP, the factors were discussed slightly differently, though they're very similar to the ones in Bakary. One of the factors was due diligence. Oh, but it was Counsel, only Counsel, um, and given the fact that the trial court did not make an explicit um, finding whether there was or wasn't due diligence, um, would this case benefit from a remand to make that determination? Your Honor, I think there is a record here regarding, and there were arguments certainly on due diligence. And so I think if, if the current trial court did reserve that specifically, if the court is inclined to review this for due diligence, I think the way that should be done is whether it would have been manifestly unreasonable to find that due diligence was exercised here. Because under People v. Mosley, the same abuse of discretion standard applies 
in, de in the de determination of due diligence in the first instance. And so that's how I would address that particular issue. Uh, but that's only one of the factors, again. And the remaining factors are similar to Bakary. Prejudice to the non-moving party in granting the continuance, prejudice to the moving party in denying the continuance, and whether the continuance could even cure the prejudice that the moving party was identifying. Now, of prime importance in DJP, as you recognize, Judge Webb, was that the defendant was being detained. That is not an issue here. And in looking at this case through the lens of DJP, it points strongly actually in favor of affirming the trial court that this was not an abuse of discretion in granting this continuance. Mr. Fibo has pointed to no prejudice to his ability to present his case. The only prejudice that he identifies is this kind of generalized prejudice of tremendous stress and difficulty finding employment that do seem to be inherent in any, in any individual facing a significant felony charge. Yes, these charges are particularly serious, but it is also difficult to see why a person facing a theft charge or embezzlement or forgery wouldn't also have similar difficulties in finding employment, for example. The prejudice to the prosecution could have been substantial, resulting potentially in dismissal of this case if, in fact, these witnesses could not have been compelled to attend trial within 12 days of the hearing in this matter. And then the motion to continue did. The continuance had a good chance of resolving that prejudice by giving the prosecution additional time to engage in the out-of-state subpoena procedure. That leaves only due diligence as a factor that even potentially favors Mr. Fibo. And even that factor is not clear-cut because this is not a case like Mann, for example. In Mann, counsel was specifically warned to get his witness under subpoena. And if his witness was not under subpoena, the trial court was not going to grant a continuance in the middle of trial. Def defense counsel chose not to get the witness under subpoena. He needed the witness in the middle of trial. The witness was unavailable, and the court denied the continuance. That decision was upheld. This is also not a people case like People v. Crow, which is discussed more in Mr. Fibo's reply brief, where counsel realized that his officer had training at the date of the hearing, filed a motion to continue. That motion was then denied. And then without any further action on behalf of the prosecutor, they appeared at the hearing and requested a continuance. Continuance was denied, and that decision was again upheld. I'd also say this is not a case like Miller, where the issue about canvas testing rose early in the case, and the request for the continuance was made the day of trial, not in advance. Can I ask a question? Yes, Your Honor. Was the issue about getting the mother to the trial or the mother and the victim to the trial? How is the victim supposed to be produced for this trial? So the, the issue in this case is about producing, the, specifically at this hearing, the prosecutor mm -hmm. side, the victim and the victim's brother. Uh, but they're only, um, the mother was the one who had custody of the two children, so that is why there's yeah. such a focus on the so mother. The mother was subpoenaed, and, she, and, and in the subpoena, it ordered her to bring the children, or were the children themselves subpoenaed? Um, so you're, there was no initial subpoena issue. There was a subpoena sent to the mother, but there was no yeah. out-of-state process. No, I know. She didn't sign the subpoena, didn't return it. Yes, but was, did that call for the production of the children as well somehow? I don't believe that that subpoena is actually in the record, Your Honor. <laughs> okay. All right. So what was the last step of this whole thing? The last step was that the prosecutor had thought she was going to come, sent her a subpoena, expect her to sign it and return it, and she never did. Yes, Your and Honor. And that was about 10 days before this hearing? That, so the call, I believe the call happened on September 3rd, 2015. Mm. The prosecutor did not receive subpoenas back on the 4th. He called her a number of times between and that date on the 4th and then the pretrial hearing on the 16th. So about 12 days elapsed when he knew that she wasn't returning his phone calls. Is that fair? That's fair, Your Honor. Okay. But even then, we do have a witness that in that phone call repeatedly affirmed or at least gave every indication that she was going to cooperate and was going to participate. She discussed the travel and the flight logistics, for example. She provided an updated address and an updated email address. They talked about returning the subpoenas, um, giving, again, the prosecutor every indication that she was going to appear. And then, yes, the prosecutor requested additional time to engage in the out-of-state subpoena process, but unlike the vast majority of cases that have been cited to this court, that did not happen the day of trial or in the middle of trial. It happened approximately 12 days before trial. 
potential, a potentially minor distinction, but a distinction all the same. The prosecution did ask for this. It did not let the issue ride when it had an opportunity to address it. It took that opportunity and it did address it. Would you, would you clarify your answer to Judge Fox's question? Because I didn't follow it. She asked, should we remand this case for findings on due diligence? And your answer is yes, no, or maybe. I, I wasn't sure what your answer was. <laughs> I appreciate that, Your Honor. Uh, my answer is I don't think this court needs to remand. Okay. But if the court is going to review whether due diligence was exercised here, I don't think that that should be con conducted as some form of de novo review. I think that that determination should be viewed as if the trial court had said, yes, there was due diligence. But he specifically said, I'm not going to decide due diligence, if I'm not mistaken. Right? He said on the record, I'm not he going to. Absolutely. He said on the record that I'm, I'm reserving my finding on due diligence. But given that the standard before this court, whether it's the entire decision on affirmance or just the due diligence question, is for an abuse of discretion, I think the question before this court is, would it have been an abuse of discretion on these facts to find, due to diligence. find that there was due Exactly, Your Honor. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate the clarifying question. What Mr. Fibo is asking this court to do, Your Honors, is to overturn his convictions, even though his right to a fair trial was not prejudiced as a result of the continuance, even though he was not being detained. To your point, Judge Webb, even though this was a continuance of only 30 days from September 28th to October 26th of 2015, and even though he had no specific right under the statutes or constitution to a trial on this specific day in September, other than a right that this trial occur within the speedy trial deadline, which it did, he's asking this court to conclude that it was manifestly unreasonable for the trial court to prefer holding a trial on the merits as, a per, as opposed to dismissing. That conclusion is not required by the case law and it is not reasonable here. Regarding the misconduct issues that were discussed in opening here, I do want to address those three questions. I, Judge Richmond, as you noted, there was substantial cross on the detective's recommendation and I would also point out that the mother had actually testified earlier that the doctor she spoke with also weren't recommending to her that they take her, the child for an exam uh, because it was unlikely it would find anything. That appears on the transcript from the 27th on pages 147, 158 through 59. Regarding the comments about Mr. Fibo's father, uh, much of that information came out in the cross of, in Mr. Fibo's cross of the victim's mother, what Mr. Fibo's father told her. These were a slight variation on the theme, but what, FIBA, what the victim's mother testified to was that uh, the father also, if it was his daughter, he would get her checked out as well. Uh, regarding the babysitter story, that was subjected to substantial cross-examination. There is, in fact, a full page of the transcript where defense counsel discussed with, detective, with the investigating detective uh, that, in fact, she had no idea what the babysitter story was. was. That was substantially rebutted. Uh, reviewing the record in this case, Your Honors, Mr. Fibo's right to a fair trial was not substantially prejudiced. This was a fair trial. The case was well tried. It was hard fought by both sides. And there's been no claim, for example, that jury instructions were improper. And we presume that the jurors followed those instructions. And the evidence in this case, in the record in this case, is that they did. They asked thoughtful questions, questions that, in fact, the record shows that the court itself and the parties had difficulty answering. Um, they reviewed the evidence. They rewatched the forensic interview. There was no substantial prejudice to Mr. Fibo's right to a fair trial. Regarding the sufficiency and remitter issues, Your Honors, unless there are specific questions that the court would like me to ask, I'd rest on the briefs on those questions. Therefore, Your Honors, the people request that this court affirm Mr. Fibo's convictions on sexual assault on a child and sexual assault on a child as part of a pattern of misconduct affirm his sentence on the sexual assault on a child as part of a pattern of misconduct, and for the reasons discussed in briefing, remand the sole count of sexual assault on a child for resentencing. Thank you. On the continuance issue, um, I just wanted to point out that this, the prosecutor's uh, complete lack of diligence is 
much less excusable than what the defendant did in the Mann case, uh, because there the expert was going on his honeymoon, which it really is a once in a lifetime event. Um, and the prosecution told the defense he thought the trial would still be going on on the expert's return from his honeymoon. And when the trial wasn't going on, the DA actually said, well, I'm okay with continuing this for a couple days so your expert can come. But the court still denied it. Um, so what the DA did here was far less reasonable and justifiable than what the defendant and man did. Um, would you agree with, with opposing counsel that the continuance in this case did not have any effect on Mr. Febo's ability to try his case and defend himself? Well, no, because I think the DA probably wouldn't have been able to go forward without the witnesses. I mean... Well, but I mean, that's, that's kind of the chicken and egg. So, I mean, if that's going to be... If, that, if that's the measure of the defendant's prejudice, you know, then, then, it's, then it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I guess my question is, so the trials continued 30 days. Was there any prejudice to Mr. Tebow's ability to prepare, you know, call witnesses, have counsel of his choice? I mean, any of the traditional indicia of an unfair trial? Not that we can identify with any certainty, but where there's this much lapse of time, circumstances change. There was this, this discussion uh, between the DA and mom at some point about how we'll give you restitution if you help us with this case. We don't know when that happened. Um, it's difficult to, to prove something like that, what would have happened um, had the case been not continued, but they were there versus continued. Yeah. So um, the, the, the diligence exercised here, or lack of diligence, was like what this court in the Wolf case identified as not due diligence. In the Wolf case, the court said there wouldn't be due diligence if the prosecution knew almost two weeks before trial that the Texas witness wouldn't honor the mailed subpoena yet made no effort to invoke the Uniform Act. Now, Wolf was a speedy trial case, but the discussion of due diligence as a concept applies here. Um, so that applies. And I think Judge Richmond makes an excellent point, which is that the DA never said it did anything to actually subpoena the children. And uh, JP obviously was the most important witness. Um, the DA did not make any kind of a record that uh, subpoenaing the mom would affect a legal subpoena or requirement for her to appear. Uh, so that's even less diligence. And on the remand question, um, there's no authority for this idea that if this court decides that the trial court didn't make a due diligence finding, therefore we should remand for that finding, the court, instead of making that finding, should review whether if it had made that finding, it would be an abuse of discretion. That just doesn't make any sense. That's not how it works, and there's no authority for that. I ask you to reverse. Thank you. <clears throat> we appreciate the arguments of both counsel. Uh, the case stands submitted. We will issue a written opinion in due course. Uh, counsel in this case are excused. Uh, when the tables are cleared, counsel in our second case may set up. Gentlemen, whenever you're ready to proceed. I, I assume you have no questions concerning <laughs> our procedures. Mm -hmm.
My name is Joseph Huff. My registration number is 34384. I represent the defendant, Mr. Bowling. This case was transferred to me. I didn't write any of the briefs. Uh, and when I first got it, my inclination was to dwell on the sufficiency of the second degree burglary because I regarded that as a very strong issue. I uh, read the briefs and was like, well, he was convicted of burglary tools too, same level of offense. So it doesn't really get me anywhere even if we do get rid of that because he was sentenced to a concurrent sentence. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on Are the first issue. Are you withdrawing issue. that issue? What's that, sir? Are you withdrawing the sufficiency? Oh, no, it? not at all. <laughs> I think it was clearly insufficient, and it actually is going to loop back into the second issue, which I'm planning to spend most of my time on, unless you have any questions about that one. My point was that even if you agree, and you should, that this was insufficient for second-degree burglary, he still has the burglary tools conviction. We're not challenging sufficiency on that, although I would say that was a pretty weak case as well, when clearly, in my mind, this was just an attempted theft of a security camera. But anyway, we can bring up that later if you'd like. Uh, I want to get to the prosecutorial misconduct in this case by analogizing the burden and proof beyond a reasonable doubt with an incomplete jigsaw puzzle. And of course, Judge Fox, you know you just wrote this case, Van Meter, so this is on the court's radar screen. In but, this, but here, defense counsel specifically said he didn't have a problem with the use of the puzzle. That's correct. So why shouldn't we conclude that's been waived, that issue's been waived? He says, I don't think it will be a problem. He also said, I don't have an objection. And before people v. Rediger out of our Supreme Court, I would have agreed that that was acquiescence. But the problem is Rediger has said that acquiescence is no longer a basis for invited error, and it's no longer a basis for waiver. It may be a basis for forfeiture, but forfeiture is subject to plain error analysis, and that's all we're really debating here is whether this is subject to plain error analysis or whether this is subject to invited error or waiver analysis. Our position is it's clearly a matter of forfeiture, if, if anything, and therefore it's subject to plain error analysis and in a little bit, I'm going to talk about why this did amount to plain error. Well, why don't you talk first about why it isn't a waiver? Because you know, in, in, in Redinger, the defense counsel had access to the instructions. He was reminded a couple times and eventually said, they're OK with me. There was no indication in the record that defense counsel had some sort of conscious awareness of the discrepancy between one of the instructions and the charging documents. Here, there was dialogue, I think initiated by the trial court, but that doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the propriety of the jigsaw puzzle analogy w was put out for, for all counsel in the court to consider and discuss, and after that discussion, counsel says, I don't think there's a problem here. No, I don't object. I mean, what, and I don't mean to be rude, but what more could there be well, that's for, not for, rude, for a waiver. But uh, clearly, I think we can all agree this wasn't invited error pursuant to Rediger. We didn't put it forward. Yeah, I agree. We didn't advance it. That yeah. issue settled. So it's, it's either waiver or forfeiture. It's either waiver, forfeiture, or subject to plain error. Uh, if it's waiver, then Rediger said it must be an intentional relinquishment of a known right or privilege. It cites a Tenth Circuit case that says waiver is accomplished by intent, but forfeiture comes about through neglect. This case, I would argue, is clearly neglect. There was absolutely no reason why defense counsel would want this, would benefit his case. He didn't advance it. He didn't put it forth. He simply acquiesced to it. I think that's very clear. When this court in People v. Perez Rodriguez addressed a similar situation where the defense counsel said no objection like he did here, the court said the, then the analysis switches to whether it's deliberate or inadvertent. 
Here, there was no evidence that it was strategic on the defendant's part. Uh, there's no plausible reason that I can see, being a former trial lawyer myself, why you would want this in, why it would help your case. Well, but, but aren't you bl blurring a little bit the distinction between waiver and invited error? Because under Stewart, if there's an invited error, we still have to ask whether there may have been a strategic purpose. I mean, I, I don't recall from Redinger any requirement that the defendant have a strategic purpose in addition to, in addition to choosing to waive a right. So maybe you a could help me understand that. I don't think you would have to necessarily have a strategic purpose, but you would have to have the intent. In this case, we didn't put it forward. There was no reason we would have wanted it to go forward. We simply acquiesced to the court and the prosecution deciding that it would go forward. I think this is a clear case of acquiescence. And before Rediger made that clear, that might have accounted for waiver. But after Rediger, it's very clear that this is forfeiture. And well, because uh, but exactly what is it in Rediger that precludes us from holding defense counsel to the consequences of his statement that this, this is not likely to be a problem, therefore I have no objection. Because it doesn't, to me at least, ex uh, express an intentional relinquishment of some known right. It's not as if he said, okay, I know that this, war, that this is prosecutorial misconduct, that this court has held in the past, that prosecutors shouldn't be lowering their burden of proof, or misconstruing it. However, realizing that, knowing that, I say go ahead and do it. Well, is it is That's defense, my intent. That was not in the record. Well, is that a realistic analysis? I mean, is, def, is defense counsel ever going to say? I don't think he would, frankly. Okay. But I'm saying that without that, what we have here, based on what we have, which is simply I don't have an objection and I don't think that will be a problem, that doesn't reflect intent. That reflects inadvertence, ignorance, forfeiture, how and can, that's how can why. It be, how can it be ignorance when the court, the, the, I don't have the record right in front of me, how can it be ignorance when the trial court tees up the issue by saying, you know, here's a, here's a jigsaw puzzle analogy and 30% and of the pieces are going to be missing? I mean, wh 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 what's ignorant about? What's ignorant is the fact that the trial lawyer, the defense attorney, did not immediately realize, nor did the trial court apparently, that that was a major problem. It's been a major problem for years in many other jurisdictions. Well, it's been a problem here since arguably Carter back in 2015. Well, hang on a second. Yes, sir. The, ju the judge did say, I do have the record, the judge, did, the judge asked the counsel, Quote, do you have, did you have an issue with the puzzle graphic being used in jury selection? And counsel responded, I've seen it before. I don't think it will be a problem. Right. It sounds like pretty intentional relinquishment of a right, maybe a right, that the judge teed up for the counsel and, and he or she said, it's not a problem. I don't have an objection. Well, I would argue that it's very clear from this record that it, he did not realize he was giving up a known right. In other words, he didn't say, look, I know cases have had issues with this. This could be a problem, but I'm accepting it. I think it's fine in this case. In that case, I would say, fine. We do have intent there for him to want why, this to get into evidence. It, and it's not a known right because this is not a clearly decided issue yet? Of using I think it has problem? been a clearly decided issue. At the time of this trial? I don't want to get into the plain error argument, but at the time of this trial, was this decided? Ben well, Meter Carter had been out, and Carter doesn't specifically say that this is a problem. It says we decide, we assume without deciding that this is improper. But any trained and skilled trial lawyer would know just from an ordinary uh, prosecutorial misconduct, you can't disparage, you can't water down your burden as a prosecutor. You can't distort your burden. You can't minimize it. You can't lower it. That invokes constitutional principles and it's clearly wrong. Maybe in this exact context, it had never been addressed before, 
But that has been the law and common sense for since time immemorial. He didn't recognize that, obviously, and that's his problem, and neither did the court. But that doesn't mean he was aware of this right. He was aware of this problem, this constitutional problem with this process misconduct, and then intentionally relinquished the problem. What, what did he mean? What, is it he or she? I don't know, whatever the counsel Counsel said, I've seen it before. I don't think it will be a problem. I've seen it before. That doesn't like mean aware that I know the legal implications of it. It just means this is a common tactic of theirs, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's relinquishing his known right that this shouldn't come in. Because clearly a good trial lawyer is going to say, heck no, I'm not object I'm objecting to this. The case law is against it. It's clearly lowering the burden. It's clearly confusing the jury. It's not good for our case. He didn't say any of that. That means to me that this wasn't intentional. Oh, okay. Uh, are you saying, and perhaps both, are you saying that the lawyer didn't know that there was a constitutional issue here, or the, the record doesn't permit us to draw that inference? Or are you saying that he did not intend what would be a reasonable interpretation of his conduct? Because I think those are different. So which is it? I, I would say they're both. Uh, I would say that it's not incompatible for him not to know the implications of process misconduct and the case law on this issue and realize that this was a problem. Are, are you familiar with the, the Supreme Because I don't think I asked because I don't think it was cited in the briefs. Are you familiar with the Supreme Court Stackhouse case on yes, closed court? Yes, okay. somewhat familiar. Okay. Well, how is this case less of a waiver than Stackhouse, which found that the, the right to a public trial was waived simply because the lawyer, the defense counsel, sat there and did nothing when the, when the court cleared the courtroom? Because I think in that case, and I could be wrong, that the defense counsel was made aware of the right to have an open courtroom, knowing that he failed to object, and that might suggest intent. I think that's what this court is getting at. And my point is, you must be fully aware. You must know what you're relinquishing. If you don't know what you're relinquishing, then it's not waiver, it's simply forfeiture. Okay, so well clearly he knew that he was, that the prosecutor was gonna use the puzzle analogy. Yes. Okay, are you saying that in addition, the record has to inform us that he had a conscious awareness that there was a a potential constitutional violation in play? I would say he would need to be aware that the bulk of case law in this area is against him, that this compromises his client's constitutional rights on several fronts. And he didn't make any showing of that, nor did the prosecutor. And in that case, we can't have waiver because we don't have enough in the record to show it was a knowing relinquishment of a right against prosecutorial misconduct. We can't assume that the defense lawyer has knowledge of the defendant's constitutional rights. He has to get up there and say, I know this is constitutional right and I'm giving it up. I and that, that, that's invited error, it seems to me. Then you're pushing it back into invited error, Joe. The, the, the distinction here is, of course, not that clear. I'm saying there has to be more in the record than, that, than what there is. And when this court in Perez Rodriguez 2017 addressed whether no objection constituted waiver or forfeiture. It says that the test is whether it's deliberate or inadvertent. My point is no trial counsel worth his salt would deliberately say, go ahead and introduce evidence that's bad for me, bad for my client, lowers your burden, waters down the burden of proof, and confuses the issue for the jury. No one is gonna say that, so I have to have the conclusion that it's inadvertence. Unless this lawyer was a total idiot, it's inadvertence. Well, the in, in, in your, we're kind of burning up your time here, but the inadvertence test really harkens back to Stewart because he objected to some instructions but not others. So arguably he was inadvertent as to the instructions over which he was silent. Isn't that qualitatively different from a lawyer who says, not a problem, judge, 
I've seen this before, and therefore I have no objection. I mean, wh how is that inadvertent in the, in the Stewart sense? I would agree with you in that analogy, but I don't necessarily read inadvertence that narrowly. Okay. And I guess that's my whole point, and my time is up. Thank you. Good morning, may it please the court. Kevin McReynolds on behalf of the people. Let's talk about waiver. Um, <laughs> defendant's test is not something that Redinger says. Redinger was an um, instruction, an instruction that was not specifically and directly addressed, which is akin to why uh, Perez Rodriguez had found there wasn't waiver there. What this case is, is this division's recent decision in T. It's indistinguishable from T. What we have there, and what we have here is defendant actively engaging the court on the specific issue uh, that was, and then um, ensuring an instruction be given to, to resolve that issue in, in the defense counsel's mind, and then stated, then I, ha I have no objection then. That, that is exactly the same scenario here. Waiver applied in T, waiver applies here. The te what we had was, basically an, an embellishment of words demonstrating an awareness of the issue before this court. Yes, I've, I've seen this before. Can I just look at the image to make sure that nothing has changed? Yes, that's what I've seen before. The court's going to give the reasonable doubt instruction to the jury before we start voir dire. Great, I have no objection then. That is waiver. That is an intentional relinquishment of a known right, which is I know I can object to this puzzle analogy, and I'm fine with the jury seeing it. Well, is, is there a more subtle question that we should be asking, though, which your opponent would say? How do we know that this lawyer, or, or how, how can we make a reasonable inference that this lawyer knew the puzzle analogy was potentially detrimental to his client's constitutional rights? I think that the the standard that he's proposing is basically a complete elimination of uh, any presumption that that lawyers know the law at all, and basically we're now going to be litigating the effectiveness of counsel on direct appeal whenever they agree for the prosecution to do something that appellate counsel later decides they didn't like, or that three years after trial, um, a division of this court finds is an issue that would be plain error if it happened again. And I think that that is, it's a dangerous road to go down. It's sort of why we have the line that we do between invited, versus, invited error versus waiver in terms of, is this something that got injected by defendant's conduct, or is this something where a defendant knew what was going on, understood the full circumstances, and said, I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and yes, Stackhouse was cited in the people's briefs. Stackhouse is, is a very relevant decision to this, which is why the T case was more akin to Stackhouse than it was to Redinger, because we had their factually not, factual knowledge of, of the circumstances and, um, and a waiver of a known right. That, that's, it is indistinguishable under these circumstances, and I think waiver does resolve the puzzle analogy issue. If you disagree, if you think that we have to have strategic reasons on direct appeal for decisions that trial counsel make, uh, again, I, I disagree with that, but if we did, plain error review under Scott, this cannot be plain error. It was not considered obvious error at the time of trial. That is determinative of the question on plain error review. After Van Meter, in future cases, cases following Van Meter, that, is, that will be the standard and it will be plain error for a, a puzzle analogy like this one to be used in the future. But it is not in 2015. Carter, um, I, don't, I know it was 2015, I don't remember specifically whether it was before or after defendant's trial. It does not change the analysis because they said even assuming this is misconduct of any kind, it wasn't obvious misconduct is what, is what Carter says that, that's definitive as far as the, the puzzle analogy issue. 
does the court have any questions on any of the other issues before it? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Judge Richmond. Even though the defendant didn't argue it, he does preserve his argument that there was lack of sufficient evidence on the conviction for attempted burglary. Yes, Your Honor. So just clarify from here, let me understand your position. Was there any evidence of defendant's intent or alleged intent to commit a burglary or attempt a burglary beyond what was on the security camera videotape? There's the security camera videotape. Um, the other evidence is the circumstances surrounding it. Um, he's approaching a medical marijuana shop in the dead of the night, dressed all in black, has his hood up, and the security tape, again, shows, shows the myth methodical pulling over and, and ch changing of the gloves. So all of those circumstances, the time of day, the fact that he had a long screwdriver in his pocket, which is something that can be used to pry a door, that is all evidence that is circumstantial evidence of his intent. Okay. He didn't testify. He did not. Okay. He didn't give a statement to the police that supported the accusation of intent, or at least none was introduced. I, none was introduced. Okay. I mean, there was other evidence that would have been relevant to intent that was not introduced, like the drug paraphernalia and the marijuana in his bag. That was also not introduced. Was there any testimony from the police officers that supported intent to burglarize? I, it was I would, a high crime area or anything like that? Uh, I, I would say time of day, circumstance, and I think uh, nature of the call. A security company monitoring it recognized it as a, as a burglary in progress, progress. The police officers both testified that they were responding to a dispatch of a burglary in progress because the most natural inference from somebody trying to take out a security camera at a business in the middle of the night is an, an intent to break in. That's what the cases like Jones uh, and uh, the other cases uh, that the people cited on page 12 of the answer brief. Jones in particular, there was no entry there. There was somebody who disabled a security camera, tried to sort of get into the backyard, claimed no intent to enter the house, but was convicted and, and affirmed on an attempted burglary because from the circumstances, you could infer the natural inference of taking out a security camera and being, being uh, in that vicinity is that you are intending to break in. But having, having watched the video, once he quote unquote takes out the security camera, like that's it, the story ends, right? There's okay. nothing else on the video. Yes, There's I agree no with that. We, we can't see what happens at right. the door after it gets turned. I agree with that. Right, well, we, we know that that little uh, magazine rack or whatever was remained in front of the door, so right. the door was never opened, apparently. There's no marks on the door, according to the police officers. Yes, I agree with you. Right. And, there, and, and he did have a screwdriver, but I'm not sure. Was, there, there was no handle on the outside of that door, so the only way to open that door would have been like a crowbar or something. It right? would have been to pry the door open, yeah. and I, I don't know whether he yeah. gave up because he, he saw that the door was reinforced or whether he tried the screwdriver and it didn't work. We, we don't, we don't right. know specifically. I agree with you. There were no marks. I think the problem is primarily and fundamentally is defendant's entire claim reverses what the standard review is here, which is that you must give the prosecution the benefit of every reasonable inference which might be fairly drawn from the evidence. It is a reasonable inference from all of this circumstantial evidence that his intent was to break in, that he gave up. There was no abandonment or renunciation uh, defense presented here. Mm -hmm. and. You, to accept his position of, I just wanted to steal the camera, you have to reverse what the standard is. Although you have to say it, the jury was required to accept his theory of defense as the only reasonable inference from the evidence, and I don't think that that's accurate. He did have a camera, though, in his. He also had a camera, another he camera. He did. Mm -hmm. right? And he didn't steal this camera, but he, we don't know what he was doing. He was slamming it with a board. I could see that from the... A after he failed to be able to pull it down or pull, it, pull the wires or whatever it was he was doing when he was manipulating it with his hands. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So my position on the sufficiency is it was sufficient. The jury could reach that inference from all of this circumstantial evidence. It was a reasonable inference, and other circumstances also uh, countered his I wanted to steal a camera theory, including um, th that he used the gloves, including that he targeted that camera 
as opposed to others that were supposedly in the alley that he what? left what? when he failed to break in as me... opposed to a, trying to take a different camera that he didn't reach. What is the significance of the gloves? You emphasize that, uh, and I watched that too. What, uh, what relevance could the gloves have under these circumstances? Uh, my my, my Normally view of it, it says he doesn't leave fingerprints. First of all, those were like big heavy work gloves. Right. Okay. Secondly, he's on the camera anyway, so I'm not sure what the what that what relevance I, it has. I, he couldn't. He wouldn't necessarily know that the camera was being monitored actively as it was. But my my point on the gloves would be, if your intent was, I'm going to pull down this camera and take it with me. If that's your intent, why do you need gloves? Those are good gripping gloves. You know. Okay. I don't know. No, I mean, I that, know. that's that's another inference, Your Honor. <laughs> but I think that there is an inference to be made that. You're trying not to leave prints as you take out the camera because you're going to go into the go into the business. And that's the only business he targeted. I think those circumstances this undermine the his his theory of defense which was not the only reasonable inference. And in order to in order to reverse this court has to find that was the only reasonable inference from all of the evidence and I think that's inappropriate. We ask this court to affirm. Mr. Huff, I'll be happy to give you a couple more minutes. We chewed up your time pretty badly arguing about Redinger, and that's that's my fault. So if you want to, if the bailiff could put two minutes on the clock. Uh, it's all right. I'll settle for that. Um, as far as the sufficiency goes, I think, Judge Richmond, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, this is pure speculation. Um, there's no way that anybody could regard this as substantial and sufficient evidence of his intent. Clearly, this was an attempted theft. The prosecution overcharged it because they wanted to file habitual counts on him, and they couldn't do that in this case because that would have been a misdemeanor. So basically, we have misdemeanor conduct resulting in a nine-year sentence because the prosecution decided to overcharge. As this court well knows, a verdict cannot be get based on guessing speculation, but must be a subjective state of near certitude of guilt. Your questioning has made it absolutely clear that there is so much speculation that must be done in this case to find that he had the intent to burglarize. But I'm not the 13th juror, as we often say. <laughs> You're not, but you have the power under the law to decide that no reasonable juror had enough information beyond speculation and conjecture <clears throat> to find him guilty of attempted second degree burglary. And I think the evidence just isn't there without a hunch, without a guessing, without inference on inference. Did you have a question, sir? Um, as far as plain error goes, our position, of course, is that this is plain error, should be analyzed under the plain error standard. It's different from Van Meter because in Van Meter, the evidence was overwhelming. And also, our U.S. Supreme Court has recognized that plain error applies at the time of appellate review, not necessarily when the issue arose. That's Henderson and Johnson. I know that ca those cases are being discussed in our Supreme Court. But yeah, is, is Henderson wouldn't be binding on us. Would it? Can't 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 the states adopt their own pr protocol for in analyzing plain error? I would assume so, but it's certainly persuasive. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we appreciate the arguments of counsel. A written opinion will be issued in due course. Uh, counsel in this case are excused. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute recess to allow a uh, setup for our third argument, which is going to involve an interpreter and some other logistical issues. So uh, the bailiff should help counsel in whatever way is appropriate. And you may announce a brief recess.
Good morning again. We have one case remaining uh, from, for our 10 o'clock docket. Uh, if any of our spectators has a uh, cell phone or similar device, would you please turn it off? Uh, to accommodate uh, any, any loss of time in terms of using the interpreter, uh, I'd ask the bailiff to put 30 minutes uh, on the clock for the appellant. That, that doesn't mean it all needs to be used, but that will be available. Uh, and we'll remain 15 minutes for the appellee. Uh, do you have any requests of us and how to deal with the interpreter? Because I have, I have not no, had an oral argument in that, in, used that way yet. No, thank you. All right, then we are ready for argument in the interest of AG. May it please the court. My name is Carrie M. Lucas. Bar number 36620. Here to facilitation communication is Cherish Rouse. Miss CJ is a single mom of six who has a mental illness, a substance abuse problem, and cognitive deficits from a brain injury. Your honors, before I get into the rest of my argument, I want to address the court's question. Service on a former attorney does not constitute service pursuant to Castle Law. Those are the Phillips, Thompson, and Lovehart cases cited in my supplement. Mr. Melbach, Ms. C.J.'s advisory counsel told the court he had spoken with Ms. C.J. about the termination hearing the week before the termination hearing. He also said he sent Ms. C.J. the notice of termination. Mr. Meloff did not indicate he sent Ms. C.J. the termination motion, case management order, or the notice to set the termination hearing. Mr. Meloff made no indication of where he sent the termination notice. He made no record that he confirmed Ms. C.J. received it. He made no record he advised Ms. C.J. He made no record he told Ms. C.J. that she was entitled to request appointment of counsel. He made no record that he told Ms. C.J. she was entitled to a court-funded expert. He made no record that he told Ms. C.J. relatives were entitled to ask for placement in a meaningful time. He made no record Ms. C.J.'s guardian ad litem ensured Ms. C.J. understood his explanations of termination. He made no record Ms. C.J.'s guardian ad litem was present. When Mr. Maloff reportedly spoke to Ms. C.J., it was long past the disclosure deadline. It was too late for her to request an expert pursuant to 193602. It was months past the deadline for Ms. C.J. to have relatives seek placement of her daughter. Ms. C.J. was not told her rights or the risks of her actions. She did not get constitutionally required notice and was not properly accommodated. This mom, who was pro se throughout the case starting at her first appearance, was confused about the case and rather than ensure she understood, was denied due process when the trial court failed to advise her at any time during the case or provide notice of the termination hearing. There is no way for this court to meaningfully ascertain the prejudice created by the trial court's error. This is an error so egregious that it calls into question the integrity of the entire judicial process. Ms. C.J. was not advised of her first appearance as required by statute and rule. Section 19.3.202 of the Children's Code requires an advisement at a parent's first appearance. Colorado Rules of Juvenile Procedure 4.2 require a 10-point advisement. The guardian ad litem argued in her briefs that Ms. C.J., was so disabled, an advisement wouldn't have mattered, 
but we do not have one set of due process for non-disabled parents and a separate, lower level of due process for disabled parents. If anything, it is more crucial the court ensure a disabled parent has a thorough advisement and language they understand to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Here the trial court simply ignored its responsibilities to advise Ms. CJ, not just at her first appearance, but again when it accepted an admission, and again when termination of parental rights was filed. Counsel. As Judge Webb wrote in People in the Inter... Um, counsel, if we agree with um, the proposition that the notice to mother of the termination proceedings was inadequate, uh, is there any reason for us to address the remaining issues that you bring on appeal? If the notice was inadequate, termination must be reversed and remanded and the remaining issues need not be reached. Thank you. A judge Webb wrote in People in the Interest of MG, the trial court was required to advise Ms. CJ about the effects of any admission and ensure she understood her rights, the allegations in the petition, and that the admission was voluntary. Here, the evidence is that Ms. C.J.'s admission was not voluntary. At her first appearance in court on June 6, 2015, Ms. C.J. said, All of these people failed to tell me that I even have a dependency and neglect case that was, that was filed, that was charged against me. The trial court, rather than advising Ms. C.J., mistakenly responded that this mother had been in court previously. The record is clear she had not been in court before, having been hospitalized or incarcerated during previous hearings. Ms. CJ's confusion on that first appearance informed the court that her admission was neither knowing or voluntary. The trial court, instead of advising Ms. CJ, who was a pro se party at this point, cut her off and refused to allow her to make a record. Had Ms. CJ been advised at that June 6th hearing, she likely would have opted to proceed to trial. During that same June 6th hearing, she tried to give the court evidence to support her case. The trial court judge refused to allow her to present that evidence. On that same day, Ms. CJ filed, pro se, a number of documents with the court in an attempt to mount a defense against the petition. Ms. C.J., proceeding pro se at that point, did not even know she had a right to a trial because the trial court failed to advise her. She also did not know that termination of parental rights was a possible outcome in the case. Appellees argue Ms. C.J. waived her right to an advisement. A parent certainly can waive a statutory right, and a waiver can be expressed or implied. However, as Judge Webb ruled in the end, G. Case, a waiver must be voluntary. Ms. C.J. never voluntarily waived her right to an advisement or her right to a trial. At her first appearance in court on June 6, 2015. Sorry, one second. To the contrary, she tried to present evidence of her first appearance in court, and when rebuffed, filed documents to support her case. The appellees argue Ms. C.J.'s absence from the termination hearing was an invited waiver. The Supreme Court recently overturned the holdings in Horton v. Southers, the case the Guardian ad litem relies upon in her brief. Mere acquiescence does not create invited error. The two recent cases are People v. Rediger and People v. Smith. 
She cannot waive rights when she was never advised what those rights were. The failure to advise Ms. CJ is a constitutional error that affected the framework in which the entire case proceeded. This is a structural error that is not amenable to either a harmless error or a plain error analysis because such errors affect the framework within which the trial proceeds and are net errors in the trial process itself. I ask the court to reverse termination and remand this case for further proceedings. I would like to reserve the balance of my time for rebuttal. That's fine. May it please the court. You my name run is. Run the podium up if you wish. Um, I think it's on your the right. Other I'm not sure how it works, Judge. Oh. May it please the court. My name is David Roth. I'm here on the half behalf of the uh, Department of Social Services, Registration Two Three Three Seven Three, Council. Uh, I intend to, to use no more than half of the time and, and reserve the remaining time for uh, co-counsel or the guardian ad litem. Um, I think it's important that in these cases that the court gain some perspective. And I think what the Pueblo court, the trial court has tried to do is look to make these cases a more of a collaborative process, a non-unintimidating process in the DNNs, um, more inviting for the parents to participate, to meet with the caseworkers, to have a relationship with caseworkers and work towards a common goal. Good or bad, effective or ineffective, it's different and it's been different. At one time, a shelter hearing would occur. Parents came in on their own. They didn't have counsel. There wasn't a guardian ad litem present. There was the county attorney present, the caseworker, and parents who hadn't been involved in this system. They watched a video advisement. And when they heard that video advisement, what they came away with was that they can take my child away for the rest of my life. They can take my child away. That's what they got out of the video advisement. And when they came to the, to the court, they were intimidated. Um, so the, at least the trial courts in Pueblo said, let's get attorneys there. Let's get them attorney up front, somebody they can talk to, somebody that they feel will represent their rights somebody who can then waive this advisement and discuss this process with them. And then what we'll do next is we'll set a family voice conference, not a caseworker voice conference, not a court voice conference, but family voice, where the family will go in and have a voice. We can talk about the treatment plan. We can talk about the process. We can talk about how to get your children home if they're out of home, and there will be a guardian ad litem there who's there to protect your children's right. I think. In a prior decision, um, a different panel of this court had indicated that maybe some of this was done to expedite the process. Well, I think that a lot of it was done to just make the process less adversarial, get more buy-in from the parents, um, get some collaboration, not just show up with the 10, 15-page treatment plan that's mandated by all of the requirements of the administrative processes that the state is under, but to outline in a less formal way, in a more understandable way of what's required, what's needed here. Mr. Roth, you're speaking in like in a generality, but are, are what you're really saying is that Miss uh, CJ actually participated in these 
uh, she did. things you're describing. You didn't say that. You said it in a very general I, way. This is what we're doing. This is what we do. Okay. And, and I agree. And, and I think I, I say it in a general way because, again, I think there's a perspective to how these proceedings went and what the idea of the proceeding was. So counsel for the mother said that the first time she ever appeared in court was June 6th of 2015. And you're suggesting that might be true, but she had other participation in the proceedings prior to that time. Well, she had participation in the proceedings all along, um, either before and definitely after that time frame, and that at a family voice conference where other individuals were present. And counsel, counsel, does our record reflect why mom was not given notice of the termination proceedings? I mean, I think the record does indicate that the advisory council, whom she had already fired and, you know, was not authorized to accept service on her behalf, uh, but does our record tell us why she was excluded from that notice? Well, I, I think, unfortunately, that there was some confusion as to what the status of her advisory council was. I think even the court um, at, at a point in these proceedings, uh, after it naming this individual as advisory council, then addresses him as though he is her counsel and was her counsel at that time. And of course, when you get to the termination proceedings and some of the other proceedings, it seems like he is acting more as counsel than as just a plain advisory counsel. But we can't look at how he's acting. Aren't we supposed to look at how mother viewed him? And as far as she was concerned, he'd been fired. Well, then, I mean, I guess if we're going to take that position, though, then do we take the position that mother, if you're your own counsel, you have to appear to court? If you if, have notice, yeah, sure. Well, certainly when the last time you were in court, you had notice that there was another court date. I mean, you were in court when there was an extensive discussion, which is in, in uh, my brief, in terms of the likelihood that termination is coming down the road, that we've just set a perm plan for one of your other children and that, you know, you really need to get on board. You really need to get with it. But she absented herself, and I credit the guardian ad litem in terms of that involuntary, voluntary absence kind of argument. But I don't know, again, if, if you aren't going to appear in court, um, how you can expect that you will have notice or, or know what the next uh, proceeding will be. Um, a, I guess a, a, a certificate of mailing would completely cure this problem. I think the, the trouble I have with that is that I think we miss a lot of what um, is important in these proceedings, which is the child, which is the best interest of the child, which is, is there prejudice? Because mom voluntarily absented herself, did she then obtain, sustain prejudice for not coming to court? Is the solution to not having your rights terminated? Say, I just won't show up. I see the writing on the wall. I just won't show up. I'll absent myself. But how do we know it's a voluntary abstention? I mean, what if she wanted to participate, but she just didn't have notice? She was in court when the next court date was set. There was a court date that she chose not to appear at. Again, I think we're making these more formal, more adversarial. I guess we could say, Next time parents don't show up, we'll issue a warrant for your arrest if you don't show up to the next court date. I mean, well, I think we do what it What was the date that she was in court when the next hearing was set? What, can you be more specific? What date was she in court when the next hearing was set? I believe at least at the permanency planning hearing, um, she appeared January 26, 2016 for a permanency planning hearing. The court heard testimony from her at that hearing. But was she in court on any date when the termination hearing was set? No, Judge, no. I Okay, okay so the, the question then is whether she had notice of the termination hearing. Isn't that the beginning, middle, and end of this case? Well, I, I don't think so because I think M.M., uh, 
addresses some of that to an extent that if you're aware that these are going on, if you're aware of what the proceedings are, if you're aware that this is coming, if, if it's been discussed and talked about, and, and then in this case you just don't show up to the next court date. Well, that, I mean, that seems to be kind of a chicken and egg characterization though. How can she choose not to show up at the next court date if she doesn't know what that, that the next court date has been set? Every court date, every court date, there was a next court date set. So although that the, the day she was there and said, be here, here's your next court date, be here, just like in that, a criminal case. That's the one case. she blew off. Right. Okay, but, but you'd have to extend your hand about three more loops to get to the termination. Well, I hearing. think it's, I think maybe one more to the setting, but I mean, I guess again, when you see that writing on the wall, absent yourself from the proceedings, um, I want to defer to okay. counsel. Anna Ulrich, th um, attorney number 33367. I'm guardian ad litem on appeal only. Um, I'd just like to note that this matter involves um, only the child, P.S. Um, this child was less than two months old when placed out of home, and she is now three and a half years old. Um, I do want to pick up um, right where the uh, judge's questions left off, and that's the issue of the notice of termination hearing. Um, I would note that, of course, this issue was unpreserved, and so uh, the Court of Appeals can decline to address it. Um, regardless, um, counsel for respondent mother um, mentioned structural error. However, we know structural error is not the appropriate standard in civil cases, and the case of RD has specifically re rejected a structural error analysis in dependency and neglect cases. Um, preferring in that particular case regarding representation at the termination hearing to go with um, substantial language of substantial error. Um, I, I want to really focus on the particular facts of this case and this issue of notice and just clarify something. We know from the record mother had notice of the termination hearing. Now we don't have record that the department actually sent her the physical piece of paper um, because for whatever reason, the certificate of mailing was not included in the record. They usually are attached to the motion. Um, I did not see it. However, we have her counsel and, uh, and at this point in time, her counsel uh, was acting as, was representing her. Now, I agree the record is unclear in that prior to the court had said you would be advisory counsel. Um, in the interim, when you go through the transcripts, they had mended their relationship, they were communicating. She wasn't present at the termination hearing. He presented evidence, questioned witnesses. So that's sort of a side note. But I wanna stress what he said about his notice to her. Um, he personally talked with mother last week. She did absolutely tell me she was aware of the hearing. I did send her the hearing notice. In addition, I sent her several letters to attempt to have her contact him prior to the hearing date. And this is after their relationship is mended. They are communicating in other hearings and he is acting as though he's representing her. She is aware of today's hearing date and the purpose of the hearing. I explained to her again what termination meant. So, this, to me, is not a situation where the mother did not have notice. We would have to disregard everything the attorney said um, to take that position. And if we conclude that he was not, that he had been fired, that he wasn't her attorney, we could disregard everything he said. So um, at the... At the, this is very early in the case. Yes, she's upset with her attorney. She says she wants to fire him. And the judge says, I'm not going to let you do that. Then she, the judge sort of backs off that and says, okay, Mr. Maloff, you can remain on as advisory counsel. And then later, two hearings down the road, the judge says, it uh, appears to indicate, no, I didn't want you to be advisory counsel. I, I wanted you to represent her to the best of your ability. So truthfully, the record is, uh, unfortunately unclear what he is, but the record is not unclear that she had notice of the termination hearing. Um, it, 
we don't know if it was sent to her specifically. I don't know that, and I can't state that, but I am confident the record shows she knew she was supposed to be there, and she chose to voluntarily absent herself. And she also chose to, and this issue was raised by the judges as well, she chose to absent herself for the three prior hearings to the termination hearing. I have um, the 7, 12, 16 hearing, 6, 13, 6, hearing and the 516-16 hearing, um, she was absent. And that's when the advisement on the termination would have occurred. Um, the department files a motion, and then at the next court hearing, the court advises a parent regarding what termination meant. A court cannot advise a parent who does not appear at these hearings in person. It's, I, I know that's not the law, because it, it'd be a waste of time. Well, um, um, in, in Appellant's counsel's argument, there were frequent use of the word service. Is this, is this simply an actual notice inquiry, or is it something more formal that the word service usually connotes more than you just know what's going on? Judge Webb, I, I appreciate you bringing it back to that issue because um, According to the case law, due process, and this is in dependency and neglect cases, due process requires parents receive adequate notice of termination of parental rights hearing. And that's the MM case, um, 726 P2D 1108. Um, adequate notice is what we're talking about here. Not perfect notice, not perfect service. Um, Actual notice. Yes, adequate is the term they use. And um, I would certainly interpret that to be actual. Um, and here, she, she knew about the termination hearing. It was not perfect service. We admit that, or at least as the record reflects. Um, but the standard is not perfect notice, and it is not perfectly completed service of the termination. Um, notice of termination plus the motion plus all the additional documents. And I'd just like to go back to sort of, it relates to the initial argument that Mother raises. Um, well, excuse me for sorry. but. I'm having a little trouble distinguishing notice of the hearing from the motion to terminate. So it seems to me we can we we might be able to set aside the question of notice of hearing because the lawyer in whatever capacity he's still an officer of the court and he tells the judge I talked to mother and she knows about the hearing. But it seems to me that might be a different question from whether she got a copy of the motion to terminate. I mean, are those separate questions, or am I just confused? Um, well, the motion to terminate would explain, you know, go through the okay, basics well, of why termination. And I think it goes back to... Oh, okay. okay. Oh, sorry. What, what does the record tell us about whether or not mother got a copy of the note of the motion to terminate as contrasted with the notice of hearing. Because I think the lawyer just said I sent her the notice. He said I sent her notice of the hearing, yes. Um, so I am not aware in the record that there is documentation mother received a copy of the motion for termination. Now, Imperfect facts, looking back, um, hindsight's always twenty twenty. You know, we have an attorney who is acting as her counsel. She, yes, previously labeled advisory, um, and certainly he received a copy of the motion, and he also says in at the termination hearing, I explained to her again what termination meant, and I sent her several letters to attempt to have her contact him prior to the hearing date, presumably to talk about what this hearing is about. So, um, no, I don't know if she received the term, a copy of the termination motion, but she had plenty of opportunity to have these rights explain to her, and, I, and that, this is where I was going, is that she also had a guardian ad litem in this case, too, for an adult, and that's a discretionary decision of the trial court, and it's generally implemented to assist a parent who's struggling to understand. And if you go through the record, that is exactly what this guardian ad litem for mother did. She was present at every hearing. She advocated for mother. It's clear from the record that she tried to um, be a go-between between mother and some of the professionals here. And so um, mother was struggling to understand, especially in the beginning, but I don't think we can 
impose a standard that the court has to um, make a parent understand a process. Thank you, I believe my time's up. CJ participated in a family voice conference where she was pushed to admit the petition and at the June 6th hearing, she complained about the process and her confusion. There is no record of the conference. of any advisement. The CJ new termination was a possible outcome. No advisement of the fact. This is Ms. CJ's first dependency and neglect case. Ms. CJ was not aware because she was never advised. This is exactly the structural error in this case. Well, Ms. CJ me, never me. knew the so-called writing on the wall. Be what about op opposing counsel's citation of authority? that structural error does not apply in dependency and neglect cases. Your position, please. The RD case declined to apply it in the RD case. Judge Taubman gave an extensive history of structural error in civil cases and suggested it may apply in other circumstances. This case is so ripe with errors and moves. CJ's rights were trampled throughout. Miss CJ has the right to represent herself. She terminated her attorney. Very clear that she did not want Mr. The record is very clear that she did not want Mr. Maloff to represent her. A hallmark of due process is the right to be heard in a meaningful time and place. The court must apply the Matthews versus Eldridge factors to assess a due process violation. Ms. C. J. did not have either service or adequate notice. She did not receive the motion, which would tell her which of her six kids was being addressed by the motion. 
There is no record the guardian ad litem was present during Mr. Malbach's explanation. The guardian ad litem in her brief suggested Ms. CJ was so impaired a guardian ad litem was needed to make decisions for Ms. CJ. Today she suggests we should disregard the fact there is no record of the guardian ad litem ensuring Ms. CJ. Had notice of the hearing. Or what the consequences of the hearing were. Let me interrupt there, if I could, briefly, please. Uh, regardless of the attorney's capacity, he is still an officer of the court. As an officer of the court, he tells the judge, I sent respondent mother a copy of the notice of the hearing. She has told me she is aware of the date the hearing will occur. Uh, why shouldn't we credit his 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 statements to the court? I mean, he could be he could be disbarred for misrepresenting those facts to the court if he misrepresented them. Even if we credit his statement. My client did not receive notice and a meaningful time to defend herself. He said he spoke to her the week before the hearing. Too late to request an expert. Too late to have family members suggest themselves as placement options. And the record at the hearing is the department's diligent search worker never contacted my client. She never had an opportunity to offer relative placements for her daughter. because she did not receive notice in a timely manner. She did not receive notice until after the disclosure deadline had passed.
closure of witnesses and exhibits. If the court has no other questions, I would ask the court to reverse termination and remand for further proceedings. We appreciate the arguments of both counsel. A written opinion will issue in due course. Uh, the case stands submitted. Count counsel are excused. And this is completes the morning's docket, so the bailiff may announce a recess. <laughs>